scientifically speaking, I think social scientists mean a particular thing when they use the term happiness or well-being. And this is the definition that I end up using in the course, which is that you can basically say you're happy if you have a lot of well-being in your life and for your life. And, and what we mean by that is that kind of happiness in your life is the sort of, you know, almost hedonistic kind of positive emotion type stuff, right? You're happy in your life if you have lots of, you know, positive emotions and laughter and so on and, and not many negative emotions. Like relatively speaking, there's not a tremendous amount of sadness and anger, although we can debate about how much of that you want. But that's kind of being happy in your life. But, but there's another feature, I think, that the social scientists really care about, and that's that you're happy with your life. And so mm. that's basically your answer to the question, all things considered, how satisfied are you with your life right now? And so I think there are these interesting moments where those dissociate, right? I have my, my academic dean here in my residential college, you know, just had a newborn baby. And, you know, I think she's very satisfied with her life. But in her life right now, there's a lot of negative emotions of like, you know, cleaning dirty diapers and not sleeping and these kinds of things. And I think, you know, I, I see a lot, you know, when I go to different talks and things of people you know, who are really happy in their life, you know, they have a lot of hedonistic pleasure, but really at their core, they're really dissatisfied with their life. And so I think, mm. I think if you're, if, in my view, if you're able to maximize both of those things, you know, that winds up encompassing things like flourishing and meeting and all these kind of lesser concepts. I think if you're happy in your life and with your life, you're doing pretty well. We want to get at what happiness feels like in the moment, but the only way we can do that is to ask people. And it's very possible that between the experiencing and the asking in any form, we're kind of getting some interesting mismatches there. Yeah. Like it could be that just having you reflect on your own positive emotions, it's going to change that, right? That might be different than kind of what I was noticing and what I was experiencing and the sum total of that throughout my day, which sucks for happiness researchers, right? Because we have to ask people somehow, you know, I wish there was a thermometer where we could get at happiness or well-being accurately without asking people, but we don't really have that. And, and we don't, it's hard for us to ever know if the act of reporting on your happiness is changing it, whether that be what you're experiencing, what you're remembering in, in whatever form. I, I almost think that the way you're framing an experience, and, and I mean that in a variety of ways, how you're categorizing it, how you frame it retrospectively, the expectations you have about it going into it. I think that those expectations and those categorizations are more powerful in some cases than the actual experience itself mm. for what, what we go through. I mean, you know, just there's so many kinds of cases like this. So, so take, you know, really classic work in the history of psychology where you give people a particular physiological response and then them give, and then give them different kinds of frames for how they make sense of it. You know, so this was back in the day, kind of before ethics and social psychology, but you basically unknowingly pump subjects full of like adrenaline, basically. You get basically give them speed without them realizing it. And then you, you set a frame for what they could be experiencing. They're either in a, in a room with other subjects who are acting really aggressively, who are really angry, or who are kind of partying. You know, they think the experiment's super fun and they're enjoying it. And what you find is that the subject's entire experience of that event depends on the frame of the other people around them. You know, if they're in a room of people who are partying and they're experiencing these physical sensations that are kind of a little bit, you know, agitated, they think it's really fun. Whereas if they're around other angry people, they find it incredibly negative and they see it as angering. And so what this shows us is our, the basic physiology of what we're experiencing, how we actually feel about it, whether that's positive or negatively valenced, or whether it's something that might lead to happiness or lead to sadness or anger. It's completely based on what our expectations are about that moment. And in some cases, the social contagion of other people's expectations about that mm. moment. So I think it's kind of a mess, but in some ways, I think that's really powerful, though, right? That means that we actually have the chance to reframe things in our life in these powerful ways, right? And I think the ancient traditions figured that out. And then, you know, the Kahneman and Tversky's of the world figured that out in modern times. And I, that's exciting because it means we can use these framing techniques to change around our experience. We don't actually have to change our physiology to change whether or not some experience makes us happy or sad. Right. And we, we actually don't even have to change the past or have avoided certain negative experiences in the past if we can reframe them in the future. You, you are always free to tell yourself a new story about the past. So if this humiliating failure that has bothered you up until yesterday can be reframed as the thing that caused you to get the tools that are now you know integral to your success or whatever it is, you can actually just change your relationship to something that used to be a source of suffering for you. And in that sense, reach into the past and put it to some order.
the most amazing thing about the human mind is that we can do that prospectively too. You know, there's lovely work by social psychologists like Ethan Cross that talk about the power of psychological distancing, basically trying to think about an event as your future self would think about the event. Mm. You know, so I'm about to go through, you know, I don't know, like a really, I'm going to have a really stressful interview with Sam Harris, right? Before I start that, I could think, well, how would future Lori want to think about this interview? I'd want to think, you know, we had this great discussion and we, you know, dealt with these hard hitting issues and, you know, this is, this is going to be awesome. And that when I, if I were to think that way, even before I started the interview, it would frame how the conversation was going. You know, if I kind of got stressed out in the middle of it, you know, I'd think like, oh, this is the hard hitting part that I really wanted to experience, you know, and, and it would kind of feel better later. And so, you know, what Ethan's shown is that we don't have to just wait till we get to the future to think back retrospectively in this positive way. We can use that as a frame in the present to shape experiences over time, too. And, and he's shown that you can do that simply by, you know, having a, a narrative in your own head that uses your future self in the third person. You know, Lori in the future will want to think this way about, you know, X, Y and Z experience that can shape it in time, in real time as you experience the event. 